here for the first two segments for the Flaming Groovies and Warren Zevon. Uh, the mm -hmm. Flaming Groovies, actually a band that I never heard of until maybe a couple of months ago when Mike, you actually sent me a text asking if I had ever heard of these guys or, you know, and I was like, of course not, because <laughs> I don't know many people who have. Um, and then when we were doing this, when we decided that we were going to be doing these kind of wayward episodes here, I just, uh, I, I was like, this sounded good when I heard it and thought it'd mm -hmm. be interesting to cover here. So um, this album is ranked number 1,651 in the 1970s. Just missed the charts. Just missed the charts, that's right. Um, in, in besteveralbums.com. In 1976, the year that it was released, it was ranked at 149. And overall, all time, 10,864. And it's actually not even the Flaming Groovy's highest rated album on Best Ever Albums. Hmm. That would be an album called Teenage Head, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which came out in 1971. So um, so I think this is a good place Which is to start a very different this. album, by the way. Very, okay. Well, Mike, this very is, different. This is anyway. good for you to jump in and tell us <laughs> what your thoughts are on this album and how you came to know the Flaming Groovy. So, uh, <laughs> so, the, uh, so I'm not... I'm not too far ahead of Matt on this. I probably heard Flaming Groovy shakes up in action maybe a year, a year and a half ago, probably like early in COVID. And um, you know what? I think one of the things people dog on the internet a lot, but for me, like easily the two greatest things about music and the internet um, is the, you know, random top 10 power pop bands you've never heard of. And, you know, top 20 obscure country rock albums from the early 70s and just like there's just i just get sucked into these things and spotify makes it so easy to just listen to something mm. and never would have been able to do that 10 or 20 years ago i mean i i sometimes think when i was if you told me when i was 12 years old that someday in the not too distant future i'd be able to pull up pretty much pretty much any piece of music ever recorded you know, on a small box in my hand and, and without paying more than 15 bucks a month. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really crazy. And I think we take it for granted. I know my kids take it for granted. So I learn a lot about a lot of new stuff that way. And the other feature that sucks me into the, uh, uh, the black hole is the Spotify. You're listening to a band and, oh, if you like these fans of this band, yep. try this, try this. And it's like a never ending cycle. So Flame and Groovies came to me out of one of those. I think it was one of those, you know, best power pop bands you've never heard of from the 70s or whatever so i also have to say much like matt the beatles are my favorite band um and uh that that melodic sense the the perfect three minute pop song i'm always on the lookout for bands that can do that well like i don't care if it's derivative i don't care if it's not doing anything new i'm a sucker for melody and a really catchy jangly three minute pop song so um as far as this album this hits all those wickets for me um, really good songs. It's, uh, and actually I have to back up a little cause I know jo John likes to use the word zeitgeist to describe mm -hmm. some of the bands. This is whatever the opposite of zeitgeist is in 1976. <laughs> this yeah, is yeah. Shakes in action. I mean, it's not at all. Um, but I would say it's, it's anachronistic to use yeah, another word. That, I should use good, more often. That yeah. is a great, that is a great word. Um, but the thing I, I liked about this album, it's, it's this, it's joyful. It's not, you know, so much music in the seventies. When rock and roll got serious, right? Like in the late sixties and early seventies, when especially with a lot of these singer songwriters and and some of these bands, the prog rock, which I love prog and all that, but um, rock sometimes these bands just took themselves way too seriously. And this is a band that just is clearly wears their influences on their sleeve. It's almost like a tour of sixties rock. Listening to this, um, listening to this album. I mean, you obviously hear the Beatles, you hear the Birds, you hear. Um, you hear some of these bands, I don't know if you guys know the association that my parents like to listen to, these sort of vocal harmony groups from the from the, uh, from the the 60s, but they do it so well. And they do it in a way that that it it doesn't sound like gimmicky. It, it sounds fresh. It doesn't sound gimmicky. Um, man, that opening track, Shake Some Action, is just a fantastic, perfect pop song. Um, and then it just kind of goes from there. But it also points forward. So there's not, it's not just... A look toward the past. I mean, there's some of these songs I was hearing. Uh, what's the name of the song? Uh, you Tore Me Down, which is track five, I believe. Starts with this kind of electric guitar part. It's kind of a slower ballad. It made me think of like 90s Teenage Fan Club or mm. Velvet Crush or some of those. It, it sounds almost like, uh, and, and I hear Elvis Costello, and this is prior to Elvis Costello in that opening track. Um, Matt, I don't know if, John, I don't know if you've heard of the V-Roys, like Scott Miller and the V-Roys, which are like one of my Uncle JB's uh, you know, early 2000s uh, Americana bands, but the song 
um, Don't Lie to Me sounded like a V-Roy song or Steve mm. Earle or something like that. So Steve I Earl, think yeah. this album, I think this album looks back. It looks forward. It's like 35 minutes long, which I'm more and more convinced that like 35 to 39 minutes is like the perfect length for just about any rock album. Um, and uh, Josh, Josh will welcome you joining his yeah. camp on that. Um, yep. Now, I will, I will say this is nothing earth shattering. It's not, I wouldn't call it essential listening. Um, and there's a reason why it's not higher on the, on the list of all time albums, because I don't think they're doing a single thing that's new, but it's just really fun to listen to. It's got a great melodic sense. I love the production. I mean, it sounds like guys just, play, so it has a little bit of that garage rock uh, mm -hmm. yep. aesthetic to it. John, I know you're a Clash guy. I'm not. I'm not mm -hmm. so much. I don't know, but I heard elements of what would become that that kind of. Uh, I don't know what you would call it. I guess pop they, punk uh, aesthetic. There's a there's a little um, bit there for sure. A little yep. bit, a little bit. But I just this is just right up my alley, and uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, there's a towards the end, and I have to I have to throw this in there. I'm not a huge fan of you. I, I think that your discussion last week about the difference between John, I believe you were talking about types of covers where you're you mm -hmm. know, sometimes it's like a tribute obviously the, the yep. beatles cover here is a tri is a flat out tribute sure but is, yep. it fits so perfectly on this album i like that it's a somewhat obscure beatles song so yeah. if you didn't know it you wouldn't even realize it was a cover because it fits so nicely with the rest of the album i think it comes along at a good point in the album because um it, not that it's getting old by this point but i definitely think this album is front loaded with its better songs so by the time Misery comes around, it's like, ooh, that's cool. Like, it sounds perfect in the, in the context of what. And I think uh, there's another cover in here, too. I think uh, she said he has a cover, I believe. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Yep. But no, I she... just liked it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Thumbs up. Gotcha. All right, Matt, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I love this, too. Mike and I share very similar um you know, interests and, you know, at the core, you know, as I've mentioned before, same with Mike, Melody, Beatles, you know, um, catchy songs, poppy songs, and uh, this is filled with that. Um, this is one of those, you know, kind of bands that it's like, it, 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 it's so good. Mike's right. It's not like, it's not breaking down any doors or anything like that, but it's just, it's um, in some ways, it I it is ahead of its time because it is foreshadowing some of the stuff that's coming down the road. There's certainly some elements of punk in here, um, yeah. but I just, I'm hearing a lot of different things. It's not just, yep. it's, it is, it's, it's also, it's 60 stuff. There's 50s doo-wop stuff in here. There's blues rock john this is jangle pop all over the place i mean you talk I, sure I, I, i'm saying you know uh the garage rock there's psychedelia in here i'm hearing country um so i and um it and i think throughout the album and as mike says it's very short but there's still 14 songs so they get in they get out they're they're, they're over very quickly um but it's not i wouldn't call this an album that's samey we've used that word a lot before you know um because even though there's elements that are similar for a lot of the songs, they, they might throw within each song, they throw a little something different that maybe this one's a little bit more country or this one's a little bit more psychedelic or this one's a little bit more doo-wop um, that kind of, you know, keeps you interested more, you know, throughout it. But um, yeah, I really like this. This is, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I am, I did a little bit of research on this band. Um, they had been around for a while. I, I, I think this is like their, I don't know, sixth album or something like that. So they had certainly been around for a while, but this is right when one of the founding members left and this album kind of marked them going in a little bit of a different direction um, than what they did before. And as Mike said, I believe that the Teenage Head, the album that we had mentioned, uh, you said, Mike, that it's a very different album. So I, It's I, much rawer. It's much okay. rawer and almost like proto-punk, like you guys have discussed, mm. like Iggy Pop along those, maybe that, not that hard, but not quite as melodic and more more uh, rough around the edges got it um so yeah it'd be interesting to kind of go back and like you know look go through their discography because even if it's very different um you know the songwriting here is is, is just fantastic uh it's just really solid songwriting and it's yeah it's very much like i'm hearing jerry lee lewis i'm hearing rem i'm hearing the who i'm hearing the birds i'm hearing mm. the stones you know um and uh just a lot of fun i agree the, the misery cover it's kind of one of those things that it, it's interesting that you guys were talking about the, the differences of the covers last week um yeah this is they're not doing it maybe it's a little bit faster right and the harmonies might not be as good as what the beatles were doing but it's still it is you know it's still a fun song it's in it and it's it mike's mike's right it's a deeper cut right so it might be it's probably a song that people that are familiar with the Beatles might not be familiar with that and wouldn't even know that it is a Beatles cover. So, um, but, uh, 
Yeah, very good. I, and the production, that's the last thing I wanted to say because I think this is a very well produced album. Um, there's some sometimes where it's more of a lush production, it's more of a polished production, and then sometimes where they hold back a little bit and it's a little bit more garage rock, a um, little bit more lo-fi. And I thought that was kind of an interesting choice that, that, that it didn't kind of just stay in one lane in terms of production. But uh, definitely up my alley. Mike was right when, he, when, he, when, you, when you passed this along to me. So you got to check this out. I really did like it. And I felt it was worth you know talking about here as a band that probably not many people have ever heard of before. So big thumbs up for me. Yeah, I uh, to come to this, just to give you an idea, the first thing that stood out to me was I didn't know the band outside of the fact that the album Teenage Head was on that 1001 albums to listen to before oh, you die. Okay. And I had earmarked it because how could, you know, we're doing those albums and how can you pass up listening to an album called Teenage Head? So like that was already had my interest. So I was like, I'll check out this band. So when we got this, I said, hmm, I remember that band and saw that it was a different album. So I said, interesting. And then I placed it on and Matt, I pulled a you okay. because I heard the first song, Shake Some Action. And I said, I know what shit, you're that's say, the but... Cracker song from the Clueless yep, soundtrack. Yep, yep, and I is. said, oh my God, I pulled a Matt that it's a song I thought was written by a band that actually was somebody else. So for the first time in the time of us doing this, Matt, mm. I got snuck by a 90s cover of a song that I should have known was yep. by somebody else. Yep. I didn't even know that. Okay. Oh, that's for funny. sure. Yeah, no, I remember that one big time. So I, I love that song when Cracker did it, and I love both Cracker well, and Camper Von Beethoven. So like that was right up my alley. Let's to begin be honest, with. it's a little mm -hmm. different than me first hearing Sexual Healing. Uh, from <laughs> well, yes, okay. they, yes, Cracker's a little more in the lanes of what yep. yeah the Flaming Groovies are doing than yeah <laughs> that. So in that, I, I will vouch for that. It's, and the clueless Soul soundtrack did so. Yeah. yeah, the first. Yeah, it's on the no alternative. Uh, yeah, I, know, first time I, I know. Yeah. I know. Matt, do you okay. do you want to give us a, a vocal rendition of what Dave Perner sounded like singing? <laughs> no, I don't. Sexual hip. No. no? Don't. Nope, okay. Needs Maybe to I'll. That'll be in the. That'll be in the director's cut. We yeah. can do that. Maybe yeah. I'll. Can I post later. that on the uh, Twitter feed, John? Will you want? You, you want to see that on Twitter? Or is the that Twitter feed is wide open for you to do that. So, yep. So those were two things that jumped out right off the bat. And as I listened to the album, the thing I said was. The two things that popped out is that this is like that mercy beat sound the Beatles had yep. in the '60s. Do you know what I'm talking about? Especially, yep, absolutely, like from the early Beatles until right around Rubber Soul Beatles that sort of dominated their sound. I was like, boy, they they do that quite a bit. And as Matt said, they also delve into you know a little bit of rockabilly here, a little bit of uh, traditional old school rock and roll, even a little bit of like girl group chorusy type stuff. Not sounding like girl groups, but that. And then actually, uh, Mike, you named one of the things I did. I said then it kind of goes. It's interesting because nowadays everything gets gets lumped with punk music and new wave, right? Because in the time they were there, and now everything new wave and uh punk at first was called post-punk and then it's punk adjacent and suddenly everything's attached to it right and so from that definition this album would fall into it but elvis costello is a great reference point because that's who i thought of immediately with this and he's often you know he's in the the borders of you know the new wave he's in the borders of classic singer songwriter power pop he was on the fringes of ska and punk as well uh there's also a lot of buzzcocks and madness Two bands that came later um, that are a little bit more affiliated with, I mean, certainly the Buzzcocks are, they're the purest post-punk with more of the punk side of it. Um, but certainly Madness is doing this and it's sort of slice of life stories, three minute songs, variety of tempos, delving into the influences. So I very much like this album. Um, it's 36 minutes, so it flew by. Um, it much like Mike said, it is certainly not essential because I would argue there's other bands that do what this band does, but do it a little bit better. Um, but that's not to say that this band isn't good. Um, I liked some of the sets of lyrics as well. It's got a little bit of that, that kinks thing where it's like British life, writing a little bit about British life, but not necessarily the countryside. It's more in, um, it being young. So from that end, it's like they wrote better songs than Rod Stewart did about being young and free and happy, right? And being in love. So that's kind of the lyrical content on this one. But yeah, the, the songs are very tight. As Matt said, this is when you're in the mid-70s now because you can tell because the studio production, you notice it's a cleaner, more polished production. Um, it, it comes out sounding like that 
mid 60s mercy beat sound but it sounds like what happens when you record with better equipment and you've learned a few more tricks of 10 more years of mm. popular music so it's very clean not aor clean necessarily but certainly not um ragged um like you would hear in punk or even some of the the post-punk stuff that has more reverb or even people that um in the 80s would write these types of songs but person like tried to gritty them up like the replacements come to mind you know these are these are guys that kind of lead into like what the replacements and the stone roses are doing in the 80s see that's funny that you say mm -hmm. that john because mm -hmm. i i actually thought now i'm not i don't know a whole lot about production but if you compare mm -hmm. this to you know the album we're going to talk about in a little bit which came out a couple years later the uh, mm -hmm. excitable boy is extraordinarily pristine oh clean yeah production this seemed a little bit rougher i know what you mean it's not exactly punk but it seemed a little murky to me you know, it's compared certainly, to a crisper production or, yeah. or what I guess what those 90s bands would do with power pop, like Matthew Sweet, etc. Well, it's, yeah, it's certainly um, a little bit murkier than even later in the 70s version of it. And in the 80s, you had some bands that were purposely cluttering it up and, per and then other things... Other groups that were trying to polish it, REM comes to mind immediately, right? That that cleaned up sort of the jangle pop sound. Not exactly like this, but um, but the replacements made it edgier. I think it's more that um, compare. I'm just comparing it more to the '60s because sure. while they were going for a clean finish, just what had evolved in terms of how you record music had changed so much that even if you were going for a raw or sound, I still think it sounded more clean than what was happening in the the mid 60s because you had a lot more studio errors and you know um and, and you're also at that stage you're doing mono right so you're getting one just sound in there as opposed to now we're in the stage where pretty much everything's studio so by nature it's going to be cleaner that's another interesting conversation in its own right that we didn't really have at the end of the 60s what production started to sound like even when you were raw or when everything was studio as compared to mono you mean stereo or stereo, excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry, stereo. Um, yeah. So yeah, that that's my first thought. It's it's just this is very enjoyable music. It doesn't sound like it was. It could have been released in '65, '71, '76, '81, '86. There's always bands all the way to the mid '80s. You know, like Oasis and stuff that are doing this type of music. Um, but that kind of goes yeah. to like, and, and Mike and I we've definitely talked about this before. You know, mm -hmm. Mike mentioned Matthew Sweet as another person that's kind of like a you know big power pop, very melodic, very great great songwriter. And there's certain bands out there and artists that never get any play and you're like well why you know what is this what was missing from this band how did this what why didn't this get any you know airplay why is this a band that we've never heard of it's not like this is something that's really off-putting or anything like the fact it's got all these elements that everybody likes you know and it's so it's, it's i wonder just, if did shake some action that chart as a single at all i wonder because it's like a per how could that not be a I wonder. Let me do it. Can I? Am I allowed to do research? Yeah, I know this yeah. is a quick. But I think that right, yeah, ahead, you talk. go ahead. But that's what we've talked about. That but before. there's it's like why are and you, you've talked about this too, John? Because don't you say like there's some band? Was it the Buzzcocks that you were saying should have been a better? Well, ever no, fallen Goldfinger. in love? No, you always said that Goldfinger should have been more popular, but they weren't attractive enough. Or something well, I like always that. said it was weird that so many in the third wave of ska, so many bands got famous, and. Goldfinger sounded exactly like them. So it was just weird that I just, I, and you know, the real answer to that is, you know, Bradley Knoll died from Sublime, right? Gwen Stefani smoking hot, you know, and there's certain other elements. And then the Boston's had their gimmick, you know, with, you know, wearing the suits and stuff. And then Goldfinger did it, but they weren't particularly attractive. They, yeah. no one died and they didn't have a gimmick, right? So they just, so that's what the context is there. But the 70s is filled with bands that made this power pop that didn't get as yeah. big as you'd think they would. Badfinger, Big Star, you know, these guys. I would always say the Buzzcocks in America did not break like you would. That's four right off the bat that did this power pop sound. If you go to the 80s, you know, one of my all-time favorites, The Replacements, you know, they couldn't, although that was somewhat self-inflicted too. But <laughs> I feel like there's always people that are making this type of power pop. And I just don't. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's, it breaks through and sometimes it doesn't. I know. It's just, it's, it's like, it, is it just the right time, right place? Like, you know, it helps um, to have a charismatic person or somebody yeah. attractive or, you know, a gimmick that, that, that a lot of times that's you that, the difference. You know, that Jim Morrison swagger or whatever, like you're talking about the front man, right? Like the importance of the front man being that, you know, the, well, and what power pop bands broke through in the seventies? Uh, it wasn't really a fertile ground no, for power pop. It wasn't yeah. really till the eighties. Cheap that trick. People, 
Yeah, that I mean, I don't Cheap know Trick, how I don't know how popular they were, but they well, they, they combined Power enough. Pop with they combined Power Pop with that Stadium AOR, and yeah, they didn't really correct. break through until they went over to Japan and became huge, and then they came back and they had a novelty record, and maybe that's what it is. You get a novelty record, and then you end up on people's radar. Yeah. So, and and so that's the other thing. Yeah, the '60s was filled with bands like this that broke through, but also, you know, we did that whole episode on Nuggets, <laughs> where yeah. there's a whole bunch of garage rock bands I that know. didn't break through. I know. So there's always going to be that. So yeah, I think. Um, Mike, did you find anything about the? Uh, no, I'm you know? I'm terrible at. That's apparently, okay. I'm not. I'm we'll a, clean I'm that amateur. Stack. We, can, to... we can do that later. But okay. uh, I also. I found, just feel. Yeah. I found. I do that... not see a top forty hit on this. I'm looking right now. Yeah. That there's yeah. not a top forty I mean, chart. I, yeah. Yeah. I'm old. <laughs> what would you say, Mike? The worst part about this is the name of the band. Oh <laughs> no! So I wanted to say that too. So one of the things I didn't do research about this. I don't know much about the band, but I do know that if you guys, you know, guys know who Grell Marcus is. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's, a, he's a pretty well-known writer, and he's a really, yep. really good writer, pretty much anything. His quote, well, interestingly, he several, maybe like six or seven years ago, he wrote a book called The History of Rock and Roll in 10 Songs, but he didn't pick obvious songs that you would think you'd write about, like Johnny Be Good or whatever, and one of the songs on that his top 10 is Shake Some Action, huh. and he has a whole chapter about this, apparently, so I, if... And one of the things he says about the Flaming Groovies is that the name is so bad, it's it's even embarrassing to say it out loud. <laughs> so, well, I think these but, days he'd be writing for like The Ringer, right? With that type of yeah. take right there, yeah. So, but his if you, if I can have it, I just he there's a little quote here about the song that I think can I yeah. read a quick? This is something I found. So this is about the the song, not about the album. Uh, he says, uh, "To me, it captures everything rock and roll has ever wanted to be. It's fast. It's urgent." It's full of despair and desire. It's tremendously exciting, and yet it's both a victory and a defeat. But what really sealed it for me was when I listened to this song, is that before rock and roll, before Chuck Berry, before Elvis, before Little Richard, no sound like the sound created in Shake Some Action had ever been heard on Earth. So Shake Some Action was my little nugget of proof that rock and roll actually was something new under the sun. Mm. That seems a little That's hyperbolic good. to me. It's, I, I appreciate it, but I don't know if I'd say nothing like this has ever been birthed in the history of rock either i think that might give it it's a great song don't get me wrong but it's well i, I think know. he's trying to elevate it and just when you when you think mm -hmm. of what it because i think with that song specific and there's i mean i don't know if you guys agree i think it's far and i think it's the best song on the album yeah. I mean, I think yeah. it's hard. To, oh, yeah. it's hard to lead up and i think that it does that it's to, to well to what are your top three song. Because I think I, for me, okay. yeah, it was a clear one. And so, then what, what so are your others? I, I like shake, so I, uh, shake Some Action, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I really like uh, Yes, It's True, which is number three. Okay. And um, what was the other one that I said? Um, probably Teenage Confidential. Yeah, the second, like that, that was one. my, that really was like. my second favorite. Yep, that was yeah. my second favorite. I actually thought but that I, but, Yes, It's yes, it's True thought it sounded like a, a ripoff of All I've Got to Do from the Beatles. It's like a very similar offbeat strumming. Like, I'm there, like, there's like a, a lot of song. things that were Beatles adjacent. <laughs> on this, this, album. One, this one in particular seemed yeah. like, oh. you know, um, to well, me. You know what? Some, the second song sometimes sounds like uh, Time is on my... Time is on my side. Is that the song? Yes, the it sounds almost exactly like yeah. "Time is on yeah. my side." I wrote that note yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah. I but I, I like the song "Let care. the Boy Rock and Roll" <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my take is just I as much as I like this album, I I don't know if I could take the Chuck Klosterman take of elevating something that sounds so much like something else that I could find into that pantheon of tracks, yeah. you know. And that's a little bit of kind of, you know, it's like. Well, it's I, also that was also I, one paragraph of a chapter, so who knows the context? Sure, I just I You're just right. like it as a band I never heard of that was doing this that, yeah. that just is right up my alley in so many ways from like the seventies. That's just it's a nice find. It's just one of those yeah. things that just when you think that's like oh I you know I got a good sense of of everything that was happening around this time or whatever, and then the, all of a sudden something drops that you've never freaking heard of and that's been around my entire life. Plus, yeah. them, you know, it's like holy. Crap. Like, and that's one of the great things. It's like there's always more stuff to find, um, which is uh, which is what one of the great things about this podcast. Well, so again, you're gonna love you, the CTS. '80s. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna love the '80s because there's a lot of you know great lost bands in the '80s doing this type of music. But depending on what you're, are you looking for it to be dirtied up? Are you looking for it to have an electronic edge with it? Are you looking for it to have the occasional 
long song mixed with it. There, you know, a lot of bands took this and I, ran John, with it. I want it all. I just don't want it to be mm -hmm. ska. Okay, that's that's all. Yeah. You know, that's. I point. we'll we'll see when we get there. It, don't worry, Josh and I have backloaded a lot of that, oh, and I we're going to make yeah. you have to I go know. off of I off know. of a, a set like. Uh, a set take that you have and make you actually have to have the take as opposed to believe you have the well, take. Well, if you guys so have to if do you hate it, you're going to definitely hate it Matt liked the Steely Dan album. That was well, that's what I'm saying. Right? I think he says stuff yeah. so often and then it's like, have you heard this in like 20 years? So we'll see. I'm not going to say you're going to suddenly like it, but I think we're not going to allow you to just walk there and go, yeah, I hate this. <laughs> I bet he likes Hotel California. Oh, I will see. Yeah, we'll that's going to be the great we'll test. See. I do mm -hmm. like that song. I can say that, you know, but... All right. Um, well, you can check out anytime you want, but I think we're going to have to leave for the oh, next Oh, look at that. Uh, John, 